Christine Bell from the University of Edinburgh. There she is Professor of Constitutional Law and she's also an Assistant Principal. She also co-directs the Global Justice Academy. Uh, Christine is Director of the Political Settlement Research Programme, which is an extremely large, uh, DFID-funded series of research projects that brings together qualitative and quantitative work. And I would encourage you to um, check out the website of the Political Settlement Research Programme. Um, there's lots of resources there, including a database of uh, peace accords. Christine has been very influential in the uh, study of peace processes and uh, peace building. Her uh, works, including a book on the law of peace, have been very influential in forcing transitional justice and human rights and uh, scholars and lawyers to engage with peace building scholars and vice versa. And those are conversations that um, are happening with greater frequency, but it, actually they have to, they have to happen um, with even greater frequency and with um, with in meaningful ways. Um, Christine, in her latest work, has been a, a promoting the notion of political unsettlement as opposed to political settlement as a more realistic way to capture the chronic and long-term unsettled nature of societies that we, we call post-conflict, but in actual fact encapsulate lots and lots of conflict, or else the conflict morphs into, um, into different uh, formats. So we're really delighted to uh, introduce Christine. I should warn you, Christine probably gets more words into the minute than any other speaker of the English language. There's a downside for that if you want to take notes. There's an upside to that if you really want value for money. Um, you get huge value in that. Christine is going to talk for about 40 minutes in, uh, in her minutes and in her words. Um, so, and we'll take questions after that. Thanks. Well, just, thank you. Thanks to um, Roger for his introduction and to Roger and Oliver for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, if the last one has anything to go for, I can see that um, nobody is immune from fatigue because um, we've been full on taking a part of the hybrid piece. Uh, I had been going to start with a joke that I decided was really bad taste, but um, Roger's introduction kind of provokes me to tell that, which was that you know, we're clearly part of what could be regarded as a Northern Irish Mafia of peace building. Uh, we'll make you an offer you can't understand. <laughs> so, um, really what I'm going to try to do today is get a kind of um, big picture, very much thoughts in progress, <clears throat> so I seem to have also gone course on the train on the way down here, um, <clears throat> which, relate, which links in some of the kind of quite prosaic bits of project I'm involved in um, with kind of some of the bigger questions of whether we are in crisis, whether it's a crisis of peace building, what the nature of the crisis might be. Uh, so you don't get lost if I talk too fast. Um, this is the outline of what I'm going to say. My piece, um, I'm going to talk about peace processes post-Cold War and the kind of changing trajectories and patterns of them. Um, I've got some sort of data. I'm a lawyer, so I don't really do quants or qualitative or... But um, we have been coding, for better or for worse, lots and lots of peace agreements. Uh, for a whole lot of areas, and, like some, and it has actually, for me, certainly, although I'm not sure why I do this project or what it means, um, it has uh, made me th see things in a different way. I'm going to talk a little bit about the changes over time from the 1990 onwards, and then reflect on whether we're now in a moment of crisis. This is my argument that I'm going to attempt to make. You may not realise I've made this by the end of the paper, so I'm laying it out now, so this is a sort of plot <laughs> spoiler. Um, I'm going to say that we're in a new mar global marketplace of transition. That's a phrase that's been used by Tom Trump for others. 
And that's central to that, and maybe this is from a lawyer coming to a, an IR or political science um, field, but that key to that is this global, um, a, a moment, I think it's quite an extraordinary moment, of renegotiation of the place and role of norms, both I mean political norms, such as commitments to democracy, and um, people can maybe talk about liberal peace, and also actually to legal norms and the structure of legal apparatus. And thirdly, I'm going to question, and I don't really have an answer here, it's a set of provocations of questions, things I'm reflecting on myself, will hopefully provoke the discussion afterwards. Is this a challenge, which I think when we put the word crisis up there, we tend to think crisis is kind of bad, or is it in fact an opportunity? So from 1990 on, as many of you are very aware, um, there had, was a rise really in what formal mediated attempts to end conflict. It differed from the practices before. I've put a whole lot of them up here. Um, I thought I could do a sort of table quiz and see um, <laughs> if you knew um, which ones they were, but I'll leave that for you to think about if you want me to go back to that slide and see. Um, but we've both um, you know, very well known um, peace processes and also less well known ones that are sort of John Pilcher's type of forgotten war, such as Bougainville, um, where 20,000 people amazingly died in 10 years. Uh, there was, a, I would argue, a new approach from 1990 onwards. I'm going to come back later on. Why? Firstly, um, that these ne negotiations and peace processes focused uh, between states and their opponents, um, and also involved direct mediation by international actors. This was somewhat of a departure from um, attempts to end internal conflict within states prior to that. Uh, there was a style of peacemaking that focused on reaching a publicly available, um, formalised, legalised peace agreement or set of peace agreements. And these had, and this is a slightly bold claim across all conflicts, all conflict types in all regions, a kind of two prongs to couple in some degree and an end to the conflict with some sort of roadmap, which I would say is a constitutional roadmap, using that as a descriptor rather than being a static document, um, to say how power would be held and exercised within the country. And the fourth thing that significantly varied, I think, from peacemaking practices up until the 1990s, um, was that the rights <coughs> of humanitarian law were understood to be, in some senses, a <coughs> regulatory framework for this practice in ways that they wouldn't have been hitherto understood. Um, that, this dynamic, I think, in ways is key to understanding mm -hmm. the challenges of what has been the peacekeeping, peace building, or I don't really use that word actually, but peace mediation to reign ever since. Firstly, that violent actors were at the heart of the new settlement, while previous peacemaking attempts often attempted to trade with moderates and um, sort of cast uh, undermine outsiders. Um, this meant that the people most responsible for the conflict on both state and non-state side were also those responsible for the new dispensation. That the compromises of the peace were translated into the new political and legal institutions in ways that continued to unfold and didn't really end. And that, that those compromises can also be understood as a clash of trying to accommodate within one framework short-term goals of ending the conflict, together with longer-term goals of creating more positive peace and a social contract that might be capable of some form of ongoing um, political self-regeneration, such as we associate um, the state political system in the UK. Uh, and part of that became encapsulated as a kind of tension between normative demands of peacemaking and pragmatic demands of peacemaking, although of course these two were not rigidly divided. <coughs> um, has this been a successful practice? It's worth just reflecting this. I realize I'm telling you so far nothing you don't know. But it has, despite controversy, it has, I think, um, reduced the amount of conflicts globally until 2014, when interestingly, and hence the photo, the figures in Syria alone really reversed the trend rather than a reversal in the entire practice, although that is beginning to change with the downward trend. Um, according to Sir and Sam Set's deconstruction of breaking the conflict trap, um, more than 75% remained ended for more than five years, which is a sort of astonishing level of success. But of course, the criticism is that this was a limited success and that it's a negative piece rather than a positive piece. 
and also often um, not fitting into incubation, where that the few failures were actually really, really massive in their consequences. And Rwanda, in some senses, we saw people go on to add in figures of even 5 million dead from DRC as a consequence, depending on what, where you think these things link up causally uh, were quite critical. Uh, this is from our data. Um, it's a bit random, but um, we had a county number of peace agreements, and I'm not going to give you all the definitions and things, but this is really um, where we see the figures. Uh, which shows that there were indeed lots and lots of peace agreements signed in the early 90s, but it also shows um, the problem is one set of peace agreements distort the figures if you put it, plot it by year, but it has, shows a practice that's not entirely failing. What if you dig down into the figures, it does also show though is that the number of peace agreements are not across as many conflicts, so what we're seeing over time is not amendments in, in the amount of negotiated settlements, but, but a slight decrease um, coupled with lots more documents and agreements and failed agreements, repeat agreements within processes. Although interestingly enough, as we've dug back into the data, um, the documentary histories have been erased. In fact, one of the things that motivates me about collecting peace agreements and documenting them is just actually a very pure notion of archiving because these things disappear in the mist. And when we go back into Bosnia, people often log one comprehensive peace agreement, but in fact, of course, there were six that were all signed, all agreed, and fell through within a matter of days, weeks, or months. Uh, so how, how we understand what the peace agreement history, and a thing that has motivated our data, has been trying to trace the longitudinal within conflicts, production of moments of agreement. Um, this is a stupid stat, but we actually log the pages of them, and these are the longest agreements. They don't include the longest agreement, which is, does anyone know what the longest agreement is? Okay, it's a little bit random, because maybe font size are different, but the Colombian Peace Agreement of 2016, that over 300 pages, is actually, according to our records, the longest peace agreement that has ever existed. But these are others, and um, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Sudan, if you include all the protocols and annexes, um, the National Dialogue Conference outcomes, which you can debate whether it's a peace agreement in Yemen. Um, the Nepal Interim Constitution, which again you can debate is that a peace agreement, but certainly if you count the South African Interim Constitution as one, I think you have to count Nepal as one. The Dayton Peace Agreement, still up there in length. And the Darfur Peace Agreement, actually, which is really massive, um, but of course didn't really go anywhere. Um, regional spread, sorry, that's a very, wait a minute. Too fast. I just I don't know if these figures really tell us something. It's very pale, but Africa again regions. I didn't know when I started this project. There's no such thing as regions and continents. It's actually all quite subjective. Um, so uh, the way we've classified it, for what it's worth, is we've put Africa excluding Middle East and North Africa, Americas, Asia Pacific, cross regional Europe and Eurasia, and this is the breakdown of the statistics. Thirty percent. For um, Africa, the Americas 12%, Asia and Pacific 23%, cross-regional, just ignore that. Europe and Eurasia 25%, Middle East and North Africa 8%. Of course, those are geographies that are hugely different, so I'm not sure how meaningful that is. Then we've also split down peace agreements around um, stage of agreement. Uh, this is the thing that I think other databases haven't done because their definition of agreements is not as broad as ours. So it's a pre-negotiation by which we include essentially all the agreements that are about getting people into the talks um, as opposed to trying to resolve the substance, although of course these things mix up a little bit. Around 31% of the agreements we've collected are pre-negotiation. Around 30% are framework, either dealing partially with issues or with single issues that are very substantive within the talks proper, or comprehensive agreements, or indeed um, what we call the constitution peace agreements. Uh, implementation agreements about 19%. We separated out the ceasefire agreements, which is around 18% of the agreements we have, although quite a lot of the other types of agreements have ceasefires as subsections within them, so that's just pure ceasefire agreements. Again, I'm not sure what these statistics tell you, but we produced them, they're interesting. This is more, this is more um, recent analysis. There's, I, there seem to me to be three quite different types of peacemaking going on um, that, that have some correlation with regional dynamics and conflict, although there's outliers. 
Um, I'm interested in what you think of this, and maybe there's other things we can think of. I'm always very suspicious when I come up with three or seven or sort of Judeo-Christian magic numbers, so whenever I end up with three points or seven, I always think there can't really be three. So, but here's three. Um, a major, and these are like styles of settlement, a major agreement, um, major political agreement by a formalized major agreement um, in a contract form, really trying to provide a comprehensive, almost quasi-contractual, um, quasi-constitutional new political settlement. The agreements in Bosnia, um, South Sudan, Sudan, South Sudan, comprehensive peace agreement in Colombia, the recent peace agreement were very like that. Uh, the second one are shorter <coughs> once-off agreements focused on I've called for better or worse, <coughs> solution settlement. Um, <coughs> between the, um, with the accommodation of, uh, so it's really, by and large, a deal between an ethnically separate sub-state region and a state, often for a high degree of autonomy, uh, and often with a level of internal power sharing between, this is controversial language, as you'll see, if you see where I apply it to, but um, a, a, an accommodation between settler and and settled and indigenous populations. Um, this would be agreements such as um, the Chittagong Hills Tract, Bangladesh, the agreements signed between Adivasi and India, but also in ways you could see Northern Ireland as an example like this, although I think the Philippi, I'm not saying there's indigenous settler communities in quite that same way. Um, the third is actually to me has been the revelation, right? Because I think when I looked at power sharing literature, I kept thinking I was seeing something else go on in the data, and it's actually, if you all think of what PhDs to do or what research to do next, this has virtually no literature on it at all, and yet it's, it's an overwhelming pattern of practice. This is where you get a ceasefire deal um, that then is to cobble together the main protagonists of the project into a set of interim transitional political arrangements, during which time that will spark off some sort of national constitution building dialogue or process which the main purpose of which is to have elections and return people into a more legitimate constitutional form of government. This is prevalent in three different contexts. It's really prevalent in Africa, where there's a kind of mix of, um, uh, it's often about dealing with coup, um, coups that have caused violence, refusal of elector, election, um, refusal of leaders to accept electoral outcomes, um, and other forms of quite complex um, political transition, but it's also absolutely the blueprint for Yemen, Syria, um, and, and those types of things. And the third really interesting example of it is, of course, international, international force-based outcomes which spark a need to rebuild the state. So in Iraq, um, Afghanistan, and... Um, uh, um, well, not so much Libya, but very much it has been about trying to get everybody into some sort of framework for governance, to have some sort of process that would lead to constitutions. Um, I said there were kind of regional connections, there's clearly outliers and examples from every region in all of these, but loosely speaking, um, there's a, a kind of a European Latin American flavour to the first brand, um, and uh, Asian and some places in Africa flavour to the middle and um, an African and, and with separate practice in the Middle East to the last, to the last one. Uh, there was something else I was going to say about that but I can't remember. Yes, maybe just to say one thing about the theories of change, right? We have to do a theory of change for our different programme. And it has struck me that there's quite different theories of change going on in these three types of things that we don't talk about. The first one, the theory of change, is that you have come to a permanent new brokerage of the relationship between divided parts of the country, deep political and ethnic and or ethnic divisions, and that that contract will continue to provide the framework indefinitely into the future. The second um, example of the theory of change is really that you have come to a new accommodation between a state which won't change and fundamentally reform and a group that have been particularly excluded or suffered violence in their particular region. And crucially there, rather than the accommodation of the first type, there's a kind of a, um, a the state will retain primacy. 
The third one is, that I would say, this incomplete wishful theory of change. It's that if you get everybody, throws everybody in and just believes what they want to believe, right? So each side comes in thinking, yay, we're in the transitional interim one, we're now going to get what we want and all this national dialogue. Well, then the internationals say, yes, we've got hoodies to give up violence, and they're going to decommission before they get in this, then they're going in, or Assad's going to come into this, and it's a nice fudge between us and the Russians, and then we'll have this constitution-making process, and everybody will just hand over to that once the elections come. And of course these don't marry, and there's not really the theory of change of how that move from one to the other is going to happen. Right, I'm doing my time. Good. Um, I wanted to point out another thing, which is that we, in the peace agreement trajectory, often miss out the fact that all of these agreements are underpinned <coughs> by forms of interstate agreement, which are either um, the outside state actors, they actually sign and engage in these agreements, disengaging themselves as geopolitical protagonists, if you think of the Cambodia set of agreements, whereby the outside powers say, right, we're not going to interfere. Um, supporting, pushing the process, setting up frameworks for agreements, sort of friends, friends of peace process and contact groups, often now including track one and track two participants. Um, thirdly, they're often at the same time sorting out their own border problems because they're in a neighbouring region whereby they've had overspilled populations of rebel groups crossing borders. Um, sometimes they're sorting out a historic enmity. If you look at the um, Oslo Accords, a part of the package was an accord between Egypt and Jordan um, around water and control. So was that agreement really about support of the accords with Palestinian or was it about the relationship between, um, sorry, between Jordan and Israel, not Egypt, Jordan and Israel? And of course it was about everything at once to some extent. Um, and there's a final thing, there's a very, one of the sort of, for me, inspirational figures of people who collect documents and do things with them was Quincy Wright who collected peace treaties for years and years and he talked about them doing three things, ending the immediate conflict, building the pattern for reconstruction and thirdly um, creating what he called, um, I'm probably not going to pronounce it right, but Antica, friendship, friendship between nations. And that was really where I wanted to do a very quick digression and actually it, it very much links to the last, um, <coughs> to the last panel. But I, we tend to view the post-1990, and I have just viewed it thus far, as part of um, a distinct phenomenon where we've talked about things like hybridity. But actually, if we go back in time, one of the things that has intrigued me has been to search for other moments when similar things happen. And as an international lawyer, a lot of us talk about, understand this, the international order to some sense attempting to govern and create and regulate these types of interstate conflicts and that's the way we talk in the international peace building community as well. But I think there's quite a convincing argument to be made that in fact efforts to resolve interstate conflict to some extent create international order in quite a powerful way. And if you look back through key <coughs> moments where we've understood international order to be created in fact, there's some really similar phenomena go on, and if you bear with me through this digression, we do come back. So I love the Treaty of Cadet, because it's one of the first ever international legal documents. It's in um, a museum in Istanbul, and a photograph of it, it's on the, like, uh, on the UN in New York. It's between Egyptians and Hittites. It's really interesting <coughs> historically, because they find fragments from both the bits. And again, it, it's, people didn't even have states here, but the very act of creating communities, talking about the enmity between communities and how to resolve it, in some sense, becomes the imprint for our early notion of treaties. And in fact, this agreement is really contemporary in its form. It has protocols, um, it has uh, transitional justice, it has everything that we see today. Everybody in the last panel keeps using Westphalian, and everything's Westphalian, and Actually, we used to joke about that and say it would be really great to use Westphalia as a sort of swear word where you go, I've had a Westphalian breakfast this Westphalian morning, but I like, go to my Westphalian work. And there is an element to which that's become, and if you open any international law book, it says international law began with the Treaty of Westphalia, 
Now, I actually took myself off to read the Treaty of Westphalia, and there isn't one treaty. There's five treaties over a period, and in fact, it deals with internal conflict and creating the relationships between it. So when you read the textbooks, they tell you it did two things. It created the state and the modern notion of the state, and it created a sort of peace between uh, a detente between Catholicism and Protestantism. If you actually read the treaty, you won't see any of that in it, or the treaties. Uh, it also produced a great flurry of artworks, and this is one of them. <laughs> um, but seriously, it seems to have inspired a lot of quite interesting art. Uh, and then the second, the third period is the interwar years, and this is in a period where culturally uh, and um, uh, and in legal and in political and peace building terms, there was a phenomenon that's very similar to what we're discussing at the conference here, whereby there was what Nathaniel Berman has called the double whammy to the state, right? So the state loses power upwards to the international level through a series, an attempt to deal with a series of inter interstate conflicts through the notion of self determination. What do we do with minorities that are left on the wrong side of the border? And for also, there's a whammy to the state from below, with the idea that the international community, and I think get the familiarity of this, will trade directly with the more authentic sub-state nationalisms and sub-state identities, which are seen as the more authentic um, voice of the local communities. <coughs> so here we have actually a very live concept of um, hybridity and an oscillation between seeing the state as the object to be traded on, as seeing sub-state and localised communities and sub-state nationalisms. And of course we could also see, to some extent, and rewrite the Second World War as also quite driven by concepts of what happened within states, both in terms of the Holocaust within Germany and the reasons for going to war by the presence of um, if you like, the justifications of minorities in other states for invasions, and again producing a new um, incarnation of the legal order. I'm going to leave out this, but the only other place I can find very similar agreements to the agreements, all of you are walking out in protest, but <laughs> nobody said he had to leave early, um, uh, where there was again a need to contract directly with sub state nationalisms. So, in fact, and a set of agreements that are produced that are very similar and have a lot of the same legal dilemmas um, of what to, how do we contract with local groups that are independence movements that are to become the state but don't have any status within the international legal system until that moment. So these forms of very hybrid internal peace building have actually been critical at every single point in creating the notion of the international order. So what do we... Um, do by this. Um, I'm going to just skip through this for the sake of finishing. To say, so where is the point we're at now? We've come, the slides I skipped, I skipped through, we've come from really a decade from 1990 to 2000 of saying that we, of uh, experimentation and growth of this whole process to a moment of both co-option and denial of the process, denial of the process with September 11, that we're very close to the anniversary of, um, and the idea that we can no longer trade with non-state armed actors on equal grounds anymore because we now go back into the language of terrorism, but coupled with the idea that failed states are hotbeds of terrorism, so we need to resolve the conflicts within them. So you get these two countervailing pressures that seem to both on one hand dismantle the peace process and its centrality and also um, <coughs> build it up and, and reinvigorate the need for it. It's also the moment where the international community nails its um, flag to the normative mast and says, literally I heard in meetings several times, um, the justice peace debate is over and justice is won. So that norms now are at least rhetorically to trump um, the idea that mediation first is now norms first and mediation should be by norms. Through to really the more complicated decade that we're in, it's very crude to put things in decades, and again there's three, so you should be suspicious, but um, in 2010 onwards I think we've reached a much more uncertain terrain, um, partly because of the land, global landscape, partly because of the reversal in conflict patterns, um, and that's really what I want to um, finish my remarks with. 
There are a number of characteristics, and Tom Carruthers, and I think a really undervalued policy paper with um, Sam at Moran, has talked about the new global marketplace of political transition. I'm not going to give his characterization. I'm just going to give what I see as the salient points of it, some of which I think have developed even since he wrote that. Firstly, it's characterized, I think, by disillusionment, the idea that both in the aid and the peace-building world, that local dynamics have somehow outwitted internationals, um, hybridity and some of the notions of the peace-builders contract are very much a reflection of that. Um, and that there's also a notion of regression, <coughs> that places that seemed like they were doing just fine and were on our kind of more successful list can regress very quickly or overnight, almost to people's astonishment, although they maybe shouldn't have been so astonished. Um, secondly, that there's a simultaneous process of norms being co-opted and dismantled, both at the international level and the domestic level, um, to set too short and therefore too controversially, but at the international level, you know, when you think of the development of R2P and the way in which sort of human rights norms are co-opted into a project of international based force, um, and there's both a co-opting there and a dismantling in the same act. And then you get think of the pushback against human rights that was going on at the same time from America in terms of the norms of torture and Iraq, or in fact the changing of the language of human rights law to human rights values. Um, in some of the key policy documents of the time. There are new regional actors not acting from, acting from a very eclectic set of motives um, that are, in, are definitely not normatively driven. And often those regional actors are disproportionately um, influential compared to um, Western actors. And now I think since Siva, Carruthers and Moran, that while there was a notion of Western actors holding the reins somewhat around the discourse of liberal peace building at the normative high level, if not the local level. Um, there's now, in particular, I think, with the UK, <coughs> the idea that Western states are actually just jumping into the fray and saying, whoops, out our norms go. We are now part of the global marketplace and we're just going to act the same way. Um, of course, I suppose, in ways, Trump is the embodiment of that, although I think it's more complicated than Trump. Not much more complicated than that. <laughs> um, another phrase is, and here I got my little Scottish picture from my most um, fantastic bun shop in Edinburgh, um, These were their um, independence referendum buns. Um, a yes bun, a no bun, or an undecided. Um, but this is quite critical. Constitutional settlement is no longer available. And the reason I put the Scottish picture up is that it hasn't been available um, in the peace building context for quite some time because in fact the compromise situations carry the compromises into the political institutions and these have been agreements to disagree and to continue and create vehicles to disagree less violently. But actually if we take a wider picture and do look at places like the UK and places like Germany, if we look at what's going on in Hungary, and in Poland, what we see are deep, deep political divisions that can no longer be settled constitutionally. And this isn't a temporary crisis of a moment of constitutional upheaval. Um, I would suggest, along with other colleagues, that it's a permanent state of being in which these issues are no longer susceptible to resolution. And in fact, if we think about it, I could put the Brexit buns up. I don't know if they've got Brexit buns, but it's a good idea. Um, but, you know, our lack of capacity to even know who resolves an Article 50 dispute, um, how, do, how do we ever even move beyond this, how do we go back in a democratic vote, how do we move away from something if it's not working, we actually do, we've run out of constitutional law and even to some extent politics for resolving this even. That's, I think, much more refined than anyone's talking about. Um, unsettlement, I think, is a condition now, it's not a temporary state of affairs. What we have created in post-conflict, which I never use, I really use post-agreement, are formalised unsettlements, where we have formalised a state of unsettlement. <coughs> and with this unsettlement, I think it's now something that characterises local conditions, national, and to some extent the great international unsettlement, um, where the kind of notion of the states and the black box has come apart and we don't have something to replace it. But there's a resilience to some extent to peace processes and it's driven by a very pragmatic politics. That there's not too many ways to end a conflict. 
One of them is to give War a chance, which is a brilliant article called that. The idea we just wait and see who wins, and the forces of nature will take their way, and that creates the most stable settlement, and all this other stuff's fine, but it interferes and it doesn't. So that's certainly an argument. Secondly, we can intervene. We can decide who are the goodies and who are the baddies, and intervene to try to help the goodies. Um, we don't tend to be that great at that. Um, or it doesn't have to be military, but force-based intervention. Or we can try to support negotiated settlements. And in some senses, what really drives the kind of the peace process is dead, long live the peace process phenomenon, is the fact that the political, um, moral, and to some extent legal compromises of the first two options um, articulated often as they are by human rights activists and, and feminists like myself are often much um, are much greater than the media than the compromises of the last option, um, and that is a kind of pragmatic politics. So where does that leave us? Well, let me just throw out some provocations to end with. Um, one oh. I haven't written time. So, <laughs> so in some senses, now I think, well, is, is, it, is it over to the critical theorists, right? Because quite often we've heard the critique of the geopolitical force. But I met recently at, at actually one of the big mediation events, you know, somebody who said, well, I'm the sort of, I'm the sort of former quasi-acting up Secretary of State for South Sudan for America. I wasn't, um, but it hasn't been reappointed yet. I'm sort of still acting at it, but probably Trump's just not going to appoint anyone. Um, and that's a story all over. There's a whole stack of appointments aren't made. So the great geopolitical power is now absent, which should really be a sort of anti liberal peace builder's wet dream. Um, but of course, is it? Uh, Secondly, if we're talking about local solutions and building them up, um, maybe now is the time where there can be some experimentation about that. And thirdly, if locally mediated attempts to mediate, it's been quite striking to me in the peace agreement database work of basically looking at um, what actually goes on in these agreements is really different from what academic discourse says goes on. People say, well, there's a toolkit and blueprinting. It never actually looks quite like that. It always looks more complex, even from the face of the agreements. Um, and it is also true that, to some extent, some of the most innovative solutions come from ones that are less geopolitically driven, where the solutions have been much more formulated within the country and trying to address what the problems were. So there's a texture to those agreements that you don't see in the 300 pages of the Darfur Peace Agreement, and even to some extent in the CPL, it's a bit of a different beast. Um, so there's a sense of which, if we want to create the international order and recreate it out of the local, actually that puts quite a big responsibility on all of us and the community of people within the country that negotiate local, uh, locally brokered peace agreements to say what type of order do we want to create. I think finally, and maybe this may be a sort of slight missionary point to end on, but um, what I would say is that we talk in this sort of jargon now about liberal peace building or whatever, but really now there's a quite a critical moment to decide whether norms and values matter or not. Right? So we do one thing as academics, there's a great paper um, in talking about the um, what's the responsibility of academics. Um, but you know, it's now up against the wire. Do norms and values matter? Or do they not? And what I would sort of suggest is that actually, multifaceted though conflict is, it's driven both in interpersonal conflict in neighbourhoods where the conflict hasn't yet got violent, and also in others to some extent, uh, without trying to be too reductionist, by senses of um, strong experience of inequality <coughs> coupled with, crucially, when it turns violent, a complete lack of agency that you can see driving indefinitely into the future for you and your children to ever change and increase your life chances in any respect. And at that point, people's backs are up against the wall. Now, what if we're really talking about agency and equality, we're talking about values. So I'll leave it Fantastic.
thank you very much, and it's always good to, to end with provocations. Um, so, uh, we've got some time for questions. Or comments to each other, so <laughs> Because well, I just tell you I have no answers. <laughs> Absolutely. I was actually looking for easy answers. <laughs> um, thanks very much, that was so interesting. Um, I'm really intrigued by the third category, well most of your categories were the same, or three or more. But the, the third category we talked about these interim institutional arrangements. Yeah. In, uh, like setting up a, a process as opposed to an agreement during which things get worked out. Yeah. Um, I'm really fascinated by that, and I'm wondering if um, you can tell us a bit more about what happens with those. Do those processes become stalled, return to violence? Uh, is, is, it, is it too soon to talk about any trend or pattern there? Um, and if I can allow me the second question. I was wondering about <coughs> in, this, in the process of negotiation, we talk more and more about involving civil society um, in negotiations. And um, I'm wondering how you regard that, and I suppose I'm informed by the conflict we'd all be familiar with in terms of the, the very long drawn out um, the Friday agreement, mm -hmm. and where the, the wider pool of actors that was involved, while we're of course we're all in favour of local ownership, the wider pool of actors, the more spoilers it seemed to encompass. Mm -hmm. um, and linked to that question of civil society being involved in negotiation any trend in terms of um, the, the, the involvement of women, and I don't just mean on the periphery, as token, uh, token. In, in terms of negotiation, yeah. Can we hear some more? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark, you could your hand up. So I, I like the way that you characterize this idea of uh, the new global marketplace of transition. I know that's not your terminology, but you're using it anyway. Yeah, and, I like the term. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, when we think about global marketplace, you often think of there's a political economy involved. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we are in a moment, I think it, it was Roger this morning was sort of making the point that this kind of, so this moment of the constant crisis is sort of this kind of zombie state where there's this involvement internationally in a variety of different conflicts. And it seems to be almost, if you think about Afghanistan and Trump's recent announcement as an example, this is sort of this permanent assemblage of intervention internationally. And I wonder if, uh, if, in that context, like with every political economy, there's there's a legal framework that would emerge uh, to sort of direct that, to, to sort of profit from it in a sense. And so I wonder if the moment of crisis has its own political economy, therefore its own sort of emerging international regime of a legal framework to maintain what is this permanent state of crisis. We'll take one more in this round. Roddy. <coughs> Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I wanted to come back similarly to, to what are your main patterns yeah. and ask you to one very specific question and <coughs> briefly build on that. Where does Central America fit in? Mm -hmm. And if you like, if that's too broad, where does Guatemala fit in? Because in many senses, right, there's a very key indigenous uh, element to yeah. the peace accord, as you know very well. So that would be kind of, your, I guess, your second one or your first one. The question of a contract, I think it very much represents yeah. a new social contract. And thirdly, of course, the question of an interim arrangement leading towards um, constitution-making process. Right? And what the curious thing is, of course, here, is that we're talking about 17 pieces of signed between 94 and 96. I think it resembles very closely the 2016 peace agreement with Colombia in terms of provisions. So you've got a land bank to try to deal with the causes of the conflict, which, of course, it doesn't do. Human rights, um, DDR, transitional justice, civil society role in Guatemala is fundamental, as it is in the Colombian case. But of course the key thing is, and you pointed that out very clearly, is that you don't have the possibility for a constitutional settlement in Colombia. They try, it fails miserably through the constitutional court. So I wonder if you might be able to talk, we're talking about, so 22 years of difference, and yet very key similarity between both processes. Okay. Right, I'll just go in reverse order because that's the way I remember them, but I have written them down. Um, so that's a really good question and I'm kind of glad you asked it because you skirt over things that you want to say. So, actually I was thinking of Guatemala, I should stress, I know nothing about most of these processes. So we have 1,536 peace agreements in our database. We've actually tried to de define a lot of peace processes. We've used a hugely crude, over conflated, like we have one in Burundi, one in Northern Ireland, you know, all the local scholars, <coughs> there's at least six. 
and there's 150 of them. Um, so I cannot, you know, this is the limits of comparative knowledge, mm -hmm. right? But having said that, I'll just talk about Guatemala, let me know what's going on. Um, so, it, so what's very interesting about these is that things that start as one thing end up as another. So to my astonishment, feeling that I did know Bosnia rather well, because I've sort of done more specific work and field work on that over many years now, um, when we got access to a whole lot of extra documents through actually the International Criminal um, Tribunal processes and the Karadic trial, which produced lots of the documents that have gone missing, um, and through David Owen archiving his papers in Liverpool, Pool, um, actually it started off as this. So the deal was you get your three-way presidency, but you get it for a time limit a bit and you get to elections and vote something else in. And of course, as the balance of power changed on the ground, that turned into the first one. Now, Guatemala did sort of arise to me as I was crudely putting out these, because I think you get, you get first of all, a distinctive pattern of formulating agreement, which is the big issue by issue, which is actually pretty similar to the comprehensive peace agreement in Sudan, even though these contexts are very different. And yet you have overlaid a whole set of micro-localised conflicts, such as indigenous people. Um, but interestingly, where I would maybe see, and I don't know enough, so it's a question, a distinction from Colombia, it seems to me you had potentially, there's, there, you had potentially a brokerage between left and right in some fundamental way in Guatemala, but ultimately it didn't hold to some extent, mm. right? The just transition to some extent did not happen democratically with the failure of the constitution making process. In Colombia it's unclear to me that that is a brokerage going on. You have a set of brokerages between the centre and the right to which it is involved with, and the, sorry, the, the state and the right and the state and the left. And in some senses you don't really have a process that's attempting to get a political settlement such as retained in the 50s with the rotation between the left and the right. You don't really have a settlement that's addressing those divisions. So though the ingredients are there, and there's only so many concerns that you can address, and lands one, and indigenities one, genders one, you know, I'm not convinced that the same type of political settlement's really going on. Um, but, but, I mean, it's interesting because it, it shows, you know, once you group things, everything's an outlier, really, in its detail, but at another level, what it also shows is the elision that happens throughout processes that start to shape the direction that everything takes. Um, the involving, um, well, the political economy, well, I'll go back to the beginning, interim institutional arrangements. So we have begun work on this and around sequencing, and I can't tell you the answers and the patterns to it, but what I can tell you are the risks of each side. So the danger is once you put people into a quasi into a government structure for the interim, of course they hold all the cards for what happens next. And there's two sort of reverse problems that you have to manage in between. <coughs> One of them is that you have to navigate between having sold too much to those people to get them to give up violence to go into the interim arrangement and having log jammed and locked up the political future for time and memorial so that even if you have elections, those people will win, right? because they've got all the mobilizing power. Um, and the second thing is not locking in enough. So if you do, the second, so another mistake is really like, as in Yemen, you create this, you try to get everyone in, and then you say, right, now over to the national dialogue process, you create this huge thing with these huge expectations, and actually the politicians and the military and political actors are over here, and they're not listening at all. And the group that's here aren't represent any more representative than the political and military actors, even though in some senses they're much more representative. They cannot actually resolve fundamental issues such as